first, I believe it is necessary to say what purgatory is and what it is not. The dogmatic and infallible declaration concerning purgatory by the Catholic Church is, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The Church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The Church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the Church, by reference to certain texts of Scripture, speak of a cleansing fire. Now that is it. All the Church says is for people who die and are going to go to heaven, yet they are not yet perfect, they need to be purified. And we call this purification purgatory. Anything beyond that is speculation. Regardless of how informed that speculation is, or who made the speculation, and with what acceptance the Church may have given that speculation. In other words, the Thomistic view of purgatory was accepted for centuries as probably the truth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is, and it was never made infallible. Purgatory is not a second chance or a halfway place. It is for those who are saved, but are not yet perfect and can't get into heaven yet because you have to be perfect. Matthew 5:48. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Revelation 21:27. But nothing unclean shall enter it, speaking of heaven, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood. Hebrews 12:23, speaking of heaven. And you have come to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to a judge, who is God of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Also, the word purgatory is just the term that the Catholic Church gave to a belief that's been around not just from the beginning of Christianity, which we can clearly see in the writings of the early church fathers, and I'll do another video about what the early church fathers had to say about purgatory, but also in Jewish history. The Jews believed in this purification after death before entering into heaven, and to this day they pray for the dead, as well as Orthodox Christians. The denial of a purification state for souls after death before entering heaven, which can be aided by the prayers and suffrage of the living, is unique to Protestants only, and consequently such denial has only been around for little over 500 years. One major objection is that the word purgatory is not in the Bible. Well, the word Holy Trinity is not in the Bible, yet all true Christians believe in the Holy Trinity. And the Bible nowhere says the phrases like, make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior, personal relationship with Jesus, altar call, say the sinner's prayer, ask Jesus into your heart. Those phrases are not in the Bible. Now, I personally would say that the Bible does not teach these things. However, I admit there are verses that could be interpreted that way. Every Christian denomination has major doctrines that are based on implicit evidence in the Bible. So while the Bible does not have the word purgatory, there is a lot of implicit verses in the Bible to prove purgatory. And Protestants should not hold Catholics to a standard that they are not willing to hold themselves to. That's being disingenuous. The next major objection is that purgatory denies the complete work of Christ on the cross. Let's be clear about something. There is no purgatory without the finished work of Christ on the cross. There is only hell for us without that finished work of Christ on the cross. Purgatory is for the saved only. If you go to purgatory, you are saved. But you don't get to sin and have no consequences. And that's what people want, to sin without consequences. But let's say a Christian committed murder and they're in prison. While they're in prison, they sincerely repent. If they're Catholic, they go to a priest. If they're a Protestant, they have perfect contrition. And they get their sins forgiven. Does that mean that now they should be released from prison? Of course not. Everyone recognizes that that person still has to pay for their crime. Well, what about the same scenario except the person never got caught and went to prison? They get to just go to heaven? No, you don't get to sin and have no consequences. And this brings us to one of our first verses. Hebrews 12:29. For our God is a consuming fire. Some people believe, 
and this is talked about in the encyclical Space Salvi by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, that after our judgment, as we approach God, our impurities are burned away, and this is painful. And that's what purgatory is. This is in line with the church's doctrine, not saying that it's what I believe, but it is in line with the church's doctrine. People often bring up the fact that Christ said to the, quote, good thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, as proof that there is no purgatory, because this thief got to go to heaven without purgatory. Well, there's a few things that I would like to point out. One, Christ did not go to heaven for 43 days at this point. He died, and where did he go? He went to what the Jews call Sheol, and the early church fathers called the paradise or limbo of the fathers, which is where those who had died before Christ and who were going to go to heaven had to wait for Christ to come. We know this from Acts 2.24, 1 Peter 3.19, and Ephesians 4.9. No one could go to heaven before Christ's resurrection, which was three days after his death. So, today you will be with me in heaven cannot be what Christ was saying. And notice, Christ did not say, you will be with me in heaven. Even though every other time he talked about heaven throughout the Bible, he says heaven, here he says paradise. Christ wasn't saying, you will be with me in heaven. He was saying that you will go to the paradise of the fathers because that's where I'm going and I will see you there. Which, yes, means that he was saved. The second thing to take into consideration is purgatory is for us to make reparations for the things that we have not made reparations for in this life. It is possible for people to make sufficient reparations in this life and avoid purgatory. The good thief died of crucifixion, a very painful death that could very well have made the reparations necessary for his sins so that he did not have to go to purgatory. Another very common objection to purgatory is a claim that the Bible says to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. The only problem is the Bible doesn't actually say that. What the Bible verse says is in 2 Corinthians 5.8, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. That's not the same thing as saying to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. I would rather be away from Missouri and be in Florida that does not mean that if I am not in Missouri, I'm in Florida. I could be in one of the other 49 states or even Europe. This is a statement of sentiment, of longing and feeling, not a statement of fact. So here are the Bible passages that support purgatory. Now, I've already given four. Matthew 5:48, Hebrews 12:29, Hebrews 13:23, and Revelation 21:27. 1 Corinthians 3:13 through 15. Each man's work will be manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each man has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Malachi 3, 2 and 3. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like filler's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver till they present right offerings to the Lord. Zechariah thirteen eight and 9. In the whole land, says the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, You are my people, and they will say, The Lord is my God. Matthew 5.25 Make friends quickly with your accuser, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out, until you have paid the last penny. Now, some people will say that Jesus is talking about temporal matters. In other words, telling us how to act while we are alive. The problem with that is everything surrounding this, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. So you would have to believe that he is talking about the afterlife and then says, oh, by the way, while you're here on earth, go ahead and settle matters quickly or you'll end up in prison. Now back to the kingdom of heaven. I don't think that that's very logical. This has always been interpreted 
in terms of the afterlife. 2 Maccabees 12.46 It is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. Now, I am well aware that Protestants do not have 2 Maccabees in their Bible. However, if I'm going to do a video on Bible verses that support purgatory, 2 Maccabees 12.46 is going to be in there because it's part of the Bible. It's not my fault that the Protestants removed books from the Bible at the Protestant Reformation. And do your own research on this. That is what happened. Look into history. Look into the formation of the Bible. And don't just look at what your church has to say about it or even what the Catholic Church has to say about it. Look at mainstream accepted historical resources on this and you will see that it is the Protestants who removed those books from the Bible, not the Catholics that added them at the Council of Trent. However, if you are a Protestant, at least consider this from a historical perspective. Second Maccabees is part of the Septuagint. The Septuagint was formed about 100 years before Christ, and it was the Old Testament for the early church. Three quarters of all quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament come from the Septuagint. So, from a historical perspective, the idea of praying for the dead so they'd be loosed from their sins goes all the way back to Judaism. 2 Timothy 1.16 May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me eagerly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. Here, Paul clearly prays for his deceased friend, Onesiphorus. Luke 16, 1-9 He also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a steward, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. And the steward said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so the people may receive me into their houses when I am put out of the stewardship. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest steward for his prudence, for the sons of this world are wiser in their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous mammon, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal habitations. St. Francis de Sales, as well as St. Ambrose and Augustine, understood this parable to be about giving alms on behalf of the dead in purgatory, canceling their debt with earthly money, which is always dishonest. That's why the master was pleased that the steward canceled the debt of others. God is pleased when we cancel the debt of those in purgatory, and they become grateful friends and advocate for us. But without that background, one can easily come to the conclusion that this passage means it's okay to be dirty in business dealings. That is contrary to the gospel. Yet, I know Protestant Christians who believe this. 1 Corinthians 15.29 Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? This is one of those scratch-your-head verses if you're a Protestant, because it does not fit into the theology that says, when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. These people are doing something for dead people, and what they're doing is clearly to help them get into heaven, hence the word baptism, which most likely means they are suffering for them. Just like Jesus said in Luke 12, 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. Christ is clearly referencing the suffering that he will endure at his passion, which he calls a baptism. Paul does not condemn this practice. In fact, he uses it as a proof against people who are denying the resurrection. Revelation 14, 4 and 5. This is speaking of the 144,000, which is not to be taken literally, it just means a whole lot of people. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offer their first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Revelation 15, 2, 3. 
and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then that had overcome the beast and his image, and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and singing the canonical of Moses, the servant of God, and the canonical of the Lamb. These two passages in Revelation show two different groups of people who were saved. One group, the 144,000, were blameless. They were virgins and went straight to heaven. The second group are in a sea of glass glowing with fire. They are clearly not in hell because they have the harps of God and are singing the songs of Moses and songs to Jesus. So they are in a place where saved people go that has fire. That would be purgatory. Luke 16, 22 through 28. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this fire. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. This is the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And it shows the two destinations of the two. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, which is the paradise of the fathers. And the rich man is either in purgatory or in hell, but I say he's in purgatory. And I'll tell you why. Because Abraham represents Christ, who calls the rich man in torment son. But Jesus makes it very clear at your judgment. If you go to hell, he says, I never knew you or I don't know you. He clearly knows him. Also, the rich man is concerned for his brothers that they will go where he is. Damned souls are deprived of all good things and deprived of everything that comes from God. They have no concern for others. Isaiah 6, 5 through 7. Isaiah is taken to the altar in heaven. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I, a man of unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. Again, nothing unclean can enter the altar of heaven. And the angel used fire to purify Isaiah and make him worthy of entering. Revelation twenty twelve through 14. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. The sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So at judgment, Hades will give up its dead, and then it will be thrown into the lake of fire. So Hades is temporary. The lake of fire, which is hell, is permanent, but Hades, which is purgatory, is temporary. Matthew eighteen thirty four and 35. This is the parable of the king who forgives a massive debt of one of his servants, but that servant will not forgive a small debt of his fellow man. And so the Bible passage reads, And in his anger his Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. Then Jesus says, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Luke twelve forty two through 48 who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come one day, when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not aware of, he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. 
Here, Jesus distinguishes between four different kinds of servants and their destinies. One, the servant who does what he's supposed to, he will be rewarded heaven. The one who beats his fellow servant, he will be cut in two and assigned a place with the unbelievers, hell. So we have the servant goes to heaven and the servant who goes to hell. But then Jesus talks about two other kinds of servants. One who doesn't do what he's supposed to do and he knows it, he is given a severe beating. And one who doesn't do what he's supposed to do, yet he doesn't know it, will be given a light beating. The last two servants aren't given a reward, yet they are not cut off and assigned a place with the unbelievers. They are given a beaten. Purgatory. So you see, we don't get to sin without punishment. Matthew 19, 17 through 22. A rich man asked Jesus, what must we have for eternal life? And Jesus said, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which? And Jesus said, you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have observed. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus seems to say one thing when asked, what must we do to be saved? But when pressed says, well, no, actually, you have to do this seemingly impossible thing. So which is it? Do we just have to keep the commandments or do we have to sell everything and give it to the poor? This is another one of those Bible verses that Protestants scratch their head at because without the doctrine of purgatory, this passage can be rather confusing. But with purgatory in mind, we can see that Jesus wasn't giving the man two answers to one question Rather, Jesus differentiates between being saved, we must obey the commandments, and having the perfection necessary to enter heaven, which at least for this man would require selling everything and giving it to the poor in order to avoid purgatory. So we can take Jesus at his word. We don't have to jump through hoops to say, well, he didn't really mean that, like those who deny purgatory often do. The key here is Jesus says, if we wish to be perfect, we must be perfect to enter heaven. We don't have to be perfect to be saved. Matthew 12, 32. And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will be forgiven neither in this age nor in the age to come. So as you can see, there are sins that can be forgiven after death, particularly venial sins. Mark 9, 47 through 49. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of with one eye then with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and we be peace with one another. Here, and this is something that's very often overlooked, we always hear the first part of that. We never hear the second, where it says that everybody will be salted with fire. If you're saved, you go to heaven. Unless you're the Blessed Virgin Mary, you are going to go through purgatory. It is possible to avoid purgatory, but in order to do that, just like with the rich man, you gotta sell everything, you gotta give it to the poor, and you gotta live a life of desolation, and most people aren't gonna do that. Well, there you have it. There's 22 Bible verses or Bible passages that prove purgatory. And like I said, I'm going to do another video on what the early church fathers have said about purgatory. When you take those two together, we see there's a lot of biblical proof for purgatory. And then we can see, as I will show in my next video, that the early church clearly believed in purgatory. They may not have called it that. It wasn't called purgatory until the 6th century. But what they described they believed is clearly what the Catholic Church today calls purgatory. And if you deny it, you're really going to have to ask yourself why and if you have good reason to deny it in the face of biblical support and historical support. Until my next video, God bless.